Hi, y'all. It's Melissa. Before we start today, this episode does talk about cursing, swearing, and language. While no curse words are uttered in this episode, as I do still want this to be family-friendly, I understand that this might not be the most appropriate episode for those who might not prefer to have these jokes as part of your daily repertoire. Parents, go ahead, check this out before letting your littles listen. If they do listen, they'll learn about Andrew Jackson, the seventh president, including his frisky parrot who had to be kicked out of Jackson's funeral because the bird wouldn't stop cursing out the 15-year-old reverend. And they'll also learn about what happens when parrots learn how to use adult language in zoos. Okay, on with the episode. Welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording still from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about some foul mouthed parrots who got evicted from a zoo. And I promise, on this show, they will not be the last. And another parrot whose F bombs got him kicked out of a presidential funeral. All right, let's go. Hey everybody, welcome back to Bewilder Beasts. Today I want to talk to you guys about a podcast I love called The Memory Palace, and I think you might like it too. My husband introduced it to me a few years ago. On it, the host Nate DeMeo crafts stories from history, often with a tie-in to today's environment and frequently to the people in the room of history, not necessarily the guy, usually, or gal, sometimes, that you might be familiar with, who also have an interesting vantage point to history just as valid and I would argue in some cases more so than the events that we all had to memorize for history tests in high school. But at the beginning of this pandemic, Nate DeMeo did something different. He did a series of 20 stories, all 20 seconds long for those who were bored of singing Happy Birthday twice to wash their hands. A couple of them were heartbreaking, some were really funny, and they were all memorable. But there was one near the end that stuck out and made me laugh so hard I had to go back and listen to that 20-second story again. It's the story of President Andrew Jackson's bird, who learned how to swear and had to be kicked out of the president's own funeral. It is appropriate for all ages, and I highly recommend this podcast, especially the episode mentioned. So we'll get into the story of the belligerent burial budria jar. But we have some other birds of an obscenity feather to talk about first. Birds frequently make the news for cussing. If you've listened to my other favorite podcast, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, you're aware that if there's a bird mentioned on the show, it's probably swearing like a pirate. For instance, two years ago, a parrot stuck on the roof for three days, swore a blue streak at the rescuers who came to help her. Apparently, she started talking all nice and sweet. I love you. And the firefighter followed explicit instructions to earn her trust by also saying, I love you. And who's a good bird? But I guess she really didn't want to go back to the coop because she became a very bad bird. She quickly escalated from pleasantries to outright swearing at the firefighters. It is pretty disconcerting to be helping someone who's yelling, off. But now there's another story about five frisky feathered friends who were separated from a Lincolnshire zoo for putting the fowl in foul language. Apparently, this particular zoo had over 200 birds all capable of speech. On the surface, this seems so cool, but the apparent avian awe turned into genuine concern when five of the birds went from ambitious and vocal when visitors would walk by, including kids, nuns, anyone who would listen, with cursing like a pirate. Once the birds would flip the verbal bird, four others would chime in and ramp each other up, setting off a cacophony of cursing cuckoos near sensitive patrons who might not have honed their own colorful language yet which worried zookeepers that the five would teach the other 200 to follow suit, turning the aviary into a towny bar. No, Polly doesn't want a f- cracker. So the birds were separated. And while this is funny on the surface, separating birds, especially bonded birds, can be incredibly stressful. I understand the allure of putting the frisky feather in into different areas, but behavior modification and reinforcement would have been kinder. 
That, or just let these five birds teach the other 200 birds some very colorful language. That zoo will make <laughs> bank. So until further notice, these birds were last seen in five different areas of the zoo. So you can be told to F off in multiple parts of the park, proving that 2020 truly is the year that keeps on giving. It's not every day that a funeral has to be stopped because someone is swearing. Less common, the swearing party removed is the owner's parrot who can't stop letting the F-bomb fly. And while that's still pretty uncommon, as far as we know, only one president had a swearing bird removed for giving the verbal bird. Andrew Jackson had gifted an African gray parrot named Pole to his wife, Rachel. When Rachel died just three weeks before his inauguration, President Jackson became the caretaker of his bird. But it's unlikely that swearing occurs in a vacuum, so it's theorized the obscenities flying out of Pole's mouth originated from the seventh president. It turns out he thought it was funny. So after President Jackson died of kidney failure, thousands lined up to pay their respects or just to say that they were there, as this president was a polarizing figure. He was known as Ol' Hickory for his very rough around the edges, rather aggressive attitudes. He was a prisoner of war, and he was also an orphan by the age of 14. Both of these things garnered sympathy from the American public. But he also relocated Native peoples further west by signing the very problematic Indian Relocation Act, his words, not mine, which stole land from Native families and tribes who are still very much affected negatively from early colonizing laws like this. Jackson was also a slave owner, which, as mentioned in the beautiful Jim Key episode, is a part of history that we as a nation, especially white people, need to come to terms with and face our very problematic history fully. And yet, he took in orphans and saved kids from certain death, but he also solidified the fate of Native Americans, many of which died at his hands. He was the first and only president to pay off the national debt and the first to have an inaugural ball at the White House open to the public where the term drunken mob was frequently used in accounts of the evening. He also fought off an assassination attempt when a man tried to shoot him with not one, but two guns, which both misfired. And when they misfired, he, at 67 years old, beat up his would-be assassin. People are complicated, and Ol' Hickory was no exception. And while I find quite a bit of his presidency beyond problematic, even as a product of the time, he did have an unpopular opinion back then, abolish the Electoral College. He thought both the president and vice president should be elected by the people, by popular vote. And given that in my entire lifetime, I have had two elections go to a president due to the Electoral College loophole and not the voice of the people, I think I could get behind this fully. He was really ahead of his time. So while those thousands lined up to wish him peace, or the opposite, or just to say that they were there, old Paul started squawking. Reverend William Menifee Norman, who was presiding at Andrew Jackson's funeral service, continued to give the sermon of the seventh president, no doubt a big deal. And he was probably incredibly nervous about striking the right tone for this monumental event. But it's hard to find the right tone when over the crowd of thousands of Americans lining the path in their funeral attire, there's a loud, <coughs> shrieking <coughs> bird. <coughs> that if you could hear, you would hear the opposite of what most people think at funerals. <coughs> Though, I have been to some funerals where we were all thinking what the bird was saying. <coughs> Pole kept going. Reverend Norman kept going. And I'm imagining both muffled giggling and utter shock, maybe a few fainting ladies for effect, until eventually the service had to pause for Paul the Pirate Parrot could be escorted from his owner's funeral service. Reverend Norman, who by all of my research was only 15 years old at the time that he was presiding over the burial, goes on to report that the presidential parrot was excited by the multitude, and he let out a perfect gus of cuss words. People were, quote, horrified and awed at the bird's lack of reverence. I, for one, over a hundred years later, would like to raise a glass to pull the parrot for making history a little more colorful.
It only felt right to keep this bird train going, so our fast fact today comes by way of Australia being Australia. Come for the scenery, stay for the birds of prey, setting fires to catch prey. Birds like the black kite, whistling kite, and brown falcon can start fires. But it wasn't initially thought that this was intentional behavior, but it seems pretty clear now that these birds have exploited the use of flame and spread fires on purpose to flush out dinner. See, these birds were theorized to take advantage of naturally occurring fires started by lightning strikes, but then they pick up branches that are on fire and fly up to 165 feet to drop fire-starting branches in unburned patches of grassland. These birds intentionally set fires, then fly to sit at the fire line waiting for small birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects to escape the flames. They will then pick up and pick off the escaping prey. Flying pyromaniac predators? Sure, sounds perfectly Australian to me. This also gives some insight as to how some fires appear to jump what's called a fire break. This is an open space or an obstacle put in the way to stop advancing fires. But if a fire department digs a giant trench to stop the advance of a forest fire, and the fire appears behind that obstacle, it might actually be that these birds are the culprit. So thanks again for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastspod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mud Stuff Media and author of Considerations for the City Dog. Now go get curious. I got today's information from CNN, The Evening Express, People.com, The Presidential Pet Museum. Yes, it's a real thing. And no, this isn't the last time you're going to hear about it. Smithsonian Magazine, Medium.com, The BBC, at Animals Behaving on Twitter for her animal behavior take on behavior modification for the separated birds. She's a lovely follow for all things animal behavior. IFL Science, because as always, IFL Science. And lastly, special shout out to Nate DeMeo of the Memory Palace, who is a storyteller who weaves interesting narratives about history. His episode, 20 Stories for Washing Your Hands, introduced me to the idea of Andrew Jackson's parrot. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. And don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with all of your curious friends. You know, all the things the other podcasts tell you to do. Thanks for listening. <laughs>